and we've got three seismic stations. This is where we're going to record the time and the amount of energy that reaches that station. So we have one seismic station here at 100 kilometers, one here at 200 kilometers, and one at 300 kilometers. And the energy starts moving out in P and S waves away from the focus, kind of that shell of energy, that radial shell. And the shallow waves moving through get here to the seismic station right away. But the waves that are traveling through this deeper layer, it takes them a lot longer to get there. They've got to go down, they've got to go along that deeper layer, and then come back up. And they arrive there quite a bit later than the shallow waves that just kind of just can go straight across. Now we've got the next seismic station, another 100 kilometers. And at that point, the shallow waves, they get there almost at the same time as the deep waves. The deep waves are kind of catching up. They have to go down, across, back up. <coughs> but it's telling me they're traveling faster than the shallow waves because they're getting there almost at the same time. And actually, by the time I get out to the third seismic station, the deep waves are getting there before the shallow waves. Well, this deep wave it goes down and it comes up, and that's got to be the same material the shallow waves traveling through. So I don't really see a difference in that material. That's all kind of the same velocity, whether it's a shallow or deep wave. That's going to be the same. But I get into that lower layer, and that's where that deep wave speeds up. And that's why it ends up being faster to the outer, the, the longer that wave can spend in the deep layer, the more time it's going to go faster than the shallow wave, and it's going to eventually arrive earlier than the shallow wave. And the longer it goes, even earlier and even earlier that it's going to arrive. So it's telling me that I've got two different kinds of rock here. I've got rock in the top layer that's maybe more like sandstone, maybe a little porous, but a slow velocity rock. And the lower layer, I've got rock that's denser. And it allows the velocity to go faster. So by just knowing uh, the velocity of these waves, you can mathematically figure out how much is where. I can take rocks in the lab, measure how fast they are, and I can figure out what kind of rocks I'm dealing with here. And one of the things he discovered is this depth between these two rock layers is reasonably consistent. And what he just did was figure out this is the crust up here for shallow waves. When you get into this deeper part that's faster, it's a different material, and you're getting down into the mantle of Earth. So he discovered the, the interface between the mantle and the crust, and we call that the moho in his eye. That's pretty cool. And what we see happen at that interface is the rock type above the interface is a type of material we call olivine. And you'll be looking at this in, in lab. <coughs> olivine um, is a mineral, and it's kind of a, um, a real glassy, um, olive, well, not olive, but a sour apple green color. And what happens is you put it under pressure, and the lattice structure of the atomic structure collapses. And instead of having kind of a wide open structure, it all compresses together and becomes a lot denser. It turns into a mineral called spinel. And spinel, being a denser mineral, means that an earthquake wave traveling through spinel instead of olivine, spinel is going to have a much higher velocity to it. And that's what happens right there at the Moho. We go from olivine with a slower velocity above it 
to that collapsed structure of spinel, a denser material below it. It shows up in the velocities, and that's the base of the crust. So it's kind of a neat way of slipping in the back door to figure this out. Well, in the early 1900s, a guy by the name of Richard Oldham, he was a geophysicist over in Great Britain, kind of a really cool looking mustache kind of gentleman, kind of the iconic gentleman of the early 1900s. And he also was looking at some earthquakes. And let's say the earthquake was here at the North Pole. And he was looking at recording stations around the world. And he was looking, he was getting the discovery of the, the P waves, everything was good. He got to a point where he was 103 degrees around Earth, away from the earthquake. And all of a sudden, the seismic stations stopped getting P waves. They disappeared. Same thing if you went the other way around Earth, 103 degrees, no more P waves. And then, at 143 degrees, Either way, he starts getting P waves again. So it's kind of like, hmm, this is kind of interesting. These P waves, easy to catch, I'm recording them, then all of a sudden, poof, they disappear, then I've got them again. So there's kind of this donut that goes around Earth where you can't get P waves. And it's called the P wave shadow zone. Yes. Wouldn't the shadow zone uh, change relative to where the P wave would start? Oh, sure. If, if the P wave, say, started at the equator, the P wave, or shadow zone, would be 103 degrees each way from that to 143 degrees. So, yeah, just as I move the, the earthquake focus around, the P wave shadow zone is going to move around on the opposite side with it. Exactly. So, he kind of looked at it and went, Then he kind of realized this curved path thing that we just talked about, the way <coughs> the velocities are going <coughs> to speed up with density and it's going to cause a little refraction to go on. He said, well, that's what's happening here. These waves are just refracting and curving. And he says, the last one I get is at 103, something happens to it. It's got to hit the big density difference, a big surface, because then it really refracts. It's not just this gradual increase in density with depth, but now all of a sudden I hit something and boom, it takes off in a whole different direction. So he said, there's got to be an, another interface down there. Not just the crust, not just the moho, but now we're talking about another interface. And he said, well, if things are coming out between 143 and 143, he was able to kind of calculate the pathways. He said, okay, here I'm coming down. Here's the 103 mark. Right there, it hits the interface. Bing, it refracts. Bing, it refracts again coming back out and it pops out over here. And he looked at all of these. He said, the only one that I see going through is this one going straight through. All the rest are bouncing around off these interfaces and ending up coming out in the middle. I don't get any between 103 and 143 because of the refraction. He just discovered the boundary of the outer core. So that was pretty cool. And now he was the one that figured out there had to be a core in Earth. The other thing he was looking at was the S waves. And when we look at the S waves, kind of the same thing. Down to 103, we're getting S waves. After 103, no S waves. But look what happens now. We don't get any S waves from 143 to 143 degrees here on the backside, like we did with the P waves. Now the S wave shadow zone goes all the way from 103 degrees on one side around the back side of Earth to 103 degrees on the other side. We're not getting any S waves through that middle section like we did with the P waves. It's even worse. 
So what's the one difference between P waves and S waves? S waves cannot go through liquids. So instead of seeing an S wave come down, hit the surface, refract, come off of there, like we did with the P wave, it can't do that because it can't travel through liquid. So the S waves are totally attenuated. They don't get through the core in any way, shape, or form. The only S waves we see are the ones that are going through the solid part of the mantle. And what Oldham just did was discover that not only is there a core to Earth, but it had to be liquid. <coughs> Neat, huh? Now, at this point, we don't know anything about this inner core. All Oldham has done is prove this outer core boundary and the fact that this core had to be a liquid core. But then along comes Inga Lehman. Now, she was a really cool lady. Let me give you an idea. She became, well, she went to college in the 20s. By the 1930s, she was head of the Royal Danish Seismological Society, or not society, but uh, research institute. <coughs> this is a time when women didn't go to college, and if they did go to college, they did not go into the sciences. So she bucked the trend both times. She lived till she was about 105 years old. But she was absolutely brilliant. She was the one that figured out that the center core had to be there and that it had to be solid and that it had to be iron nickel. She did Oldham one better. She built on what he had discovered and agreed with it, but then she looked at another earthquake and she said, you know something, we've got a little bit of a problem. You know that P wave that comes straight through? It's not arriving at the right time. It should slow down. If this was all liquid, the P wave will make it through, but it's gonna slow down in liquid. And she said, the problem is, if it were slowing down from where it entered the core to where it left the core, it's arriving too early, too fast. There's got to be something in here that's allowing that wave to speed up for a while. And she went into the lab and she started experimenting with different materials putting energy waves through them, seeing what could speed it up, trying to figure out the right amount, the right type of material. And she figured out what the size had to be, and she figured out that the, about the only material that worked for a size that would fit within the liquid core would be uh, uh, basically iron magnesium, or iron nickel core. It had to be a mix of those two metals. And she was right. What is amazing is how right she was. In the 1960s, the United States was doing a series of underground atom bomb tests out in the desert near Las Vegas. In fact, the big thing was to uh, have a party in Las Vegas and go out at night and watch the atom bomb blow up. You could see a big mushroom cloud on the horizon. It was pretty exciting. Pretty stupid to be hanging around watching it, but it was the thing to do. But in order to really know what they were doing, they knew exactly how much energy the bomb was supposed to produce, and they could measure it during the explosion. They knew how deep they buried the bomb, they knew just where the, the beginning point of the explosion was, like an earthquake, the focus. And they had invented a new timing mechanism, the atomic clock, which uses the vibration of atoms in order to synchronize all the recording stations. So there wouldn't be any error between this station and that station. All the measurements would be very, very precise and all synchronized to the same time. So it basically took all the big error out of the measurement. And sure enough, the data that they got back and the calculations they could do definitively proved the outer core, inner core boundaries, and the sizes of those cores. And Inga Lehman's calculations were spot on. That's pretty cool. 
So if I look at the velocities of these waves going through Earth, I see things starting to get pretty fast as I come down through the crust and I hit the moho. Notice the moho is just it's not very deep. And then things kind of pick up and I have a pretty rapid uh, velocity increase in S waves and P waves <coughs> as I go through what we call the lower part of the sthenosphere. And then as I go into the proper part of the mantle here, I see P waves increase, S waves not quite as fast, but that's that increasing, gradually increasing with depth, with density. And then I hit the outer core, the liquid outer core. And notice, the liquid outer core, the P waves get way slower. It really slows them up, but look what happens to the S waves. That's it, they're attenuated, they're gone. The P wave gets faster through the liquid because of the density, it's getting squeezed, it's getting denser. Then it hits the iron nickel core, look at the jump it takes. There's the interface, it stays pretty constant because we're getting pretty close to the center. There isn't a whole lot more compression going on. And then it all reverses coming out the other side. So we can pretty much figure out where these interfaces are, what the compositions are, how big the cores have to be, and all that based on these velocity curves. So true or false? The P wave shadow zone is caused by refraction of the P wave at the mantle inner core discontinuity. Discontinuity is just a big fancy word for the interface, okay? So read this one carefully, It'll take 20 seconds. So not only is the pressure increasing as we go toward the center, but as pressure goes up, temperature goes up, right? They're proportionate, directly proportional. So if the pressure is going up as I go toward the center, that means so is the temperature. And certainly we end up with a liquid outer core. So by the time we get to the mantle outer core discontinuity, the temperatures are high enough that the rocks are melted at that point. And we see that right here. Here we come down through the, through the mantle. We see kind of a temperature increase right here just before the mantle, and then boom, here's the outer core. This is all melted. And we see kind of another really high part of the temperature curve and that's down here in the inner core. It's even hotter than the liquid outer core. So what's wrong with this picture? If the temperature back here, the lower temperature is enough to melt the outer core, why is the higher temperature not also